one of the things that was happening around the same time is that you were realizing that there's this personal struggle going mm -hmm. on inside of you mm -hmm. and it was almost at odds with mm -hmm. what you were trying to accomplish. Right. Would you mind yeah. sharing about that? Uh, definitely, you know, for years, probably since I was 11 years old, I think I first saw, you know, a pornographic image. That was a struggle inside of my heart. And I kind of got to the point where I accepted defeat and just said, okay, this seems like this is going to be a part of my life for the, forever. Uh, and now, God, you seem to be calling me into something that is supposed to end sexual exploitation while I'm part of the problem. Hey everyone, thank you so much for being here today. We have a very special guest, David, who has a story that is kind of similar to mine, but also very unique. And I'm excited to chat with you. So David, welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Well, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you have been working on the last few years. Yeah, I'm the founder of an organization called Win the Saints. That song, you know, Win the Saints, Go Marching mm -hmm. In, that's kind of what it's named after. Okay. Yeah, we've been, you know, an organization since 2011, and we just work in Malawi. We've actually built the first long-term trauma counseling and vocational training center for young girls ages 5 to 15 who have been forced into prostitution or sexually exploited. So our, our hope, our desire is to glorify the name of Jesus and see an end to sexual exploitation in the country of Malawi. And one of the reasons that we have you here today is because you're actually going to Malawi right now and you're on a plane going through the DC area and <laughs> yeah. you just stopped in here to have this. So thank you for being here. Yeah, um, absolutely. You're going to land in Malawi in just a couple, a day, a couple of days. We're going to swing by Kenya to see Essie's family for about three weeks. Okay. And, and Essie is your wife. Who, yes. Yeah. Maybe a, maybe a separate interview. We'll get into some of that. But yeah. um, so I think before we get started, I would like to take a quick break and show our viewers the trailer for a documentary that just came out about you. So okay. uh, we'll be right back. The fight against human trafficking isn't this international battle that's happening in other countries and there's this new wave of showing people that wow it's actually happening inside of America and maybe like in your communities. It's way deeper and like closer to us than that. The struggle against sexual exploitation and human trafficking is like inside of each of our hearts. Malawi is called the warm heart of Africa because of the warmness of people. People who do not complain even when they are going through a lot of problems. Our pastor suggests that we all in the church do some kind of fast. And two of my friends are like, we're going to full on do a 21 day, no food, just drinking juice. I went into my basement at 11.30 on the 21st night of this fast. I stayed there till 6 in the morning when Jesus whispered. Somebody picks my name on the internet and comes and breaks this news. Is he really ready for a mission in Malawi? And they said over 70% of the girls said they weren't willing participants in their first sexual encounter at the average age of 12 years old. If a girl says, I don't know, I don't, I don't want that, I know, I'll give you money. Maybe they are even rape her. People are speaking up and yet there are no services for them to get help. For him it was a vision, for me it was a dream that I've been dreaming all the time. Is this just wishful thinking? This dream that you've had for 14 years and you've been praying about and this dream that Jesus has also shared with me, it's becoming a reality. We have to go to this place where we are going to meet a chief. If this facility is properly resourced, it will be the first of this kind in Malawi. People will say, those ones that were there made history, and we saw the first girl entering this place. My passion with anti-trafficking stuff is not just for the girls directly, but for the church and for things like pornography and exploitation being eradicated out of our own hearts. When I was younger, yeah. you know, I used to look at pornography. I would stop maybe for one month, but then I would fail. I firmly believe that Jesus has a destiny for the church, and it's being hindered by our yoke to sexual immorality. My inability to change myself, my inability to save myself. He's standing there and he's leaning over the balcony of heaven, so desiring for you to have holiness and for you to have victory. And he is with you in this. And if the heart of man has changed, which I believe only the gospel can do, sexual exploitation would actually be eradicated because the demand wouldn't be there anymore. Even if I'm changing one person per year, I don't mind. I will move on and on. And don't put limitations on what you think you're even capable of or not capable of. Because it's not about you. <laughs> it's about what he's capable of through you. And it's a lot.
All right, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the trailer. Uh, David, tell us, how did it come to pass that a documentary was made about you? Mm. What, what was it that someone said, you know what, this guy needs a movie about him? What was that? <laughs> Well, one of my best friends in the whole world, a guy named Dan Paris, started a production company and we made a documentary together way back in 2009. We did research on the causes and solutions to extreme poverty. We lived on $1.25 a day. That's a whole separate project. Really? Yeah, for about four and a half months, we traveled through 15 countries. Hold on a second, wait. <laughs> What's the name of this? It was called Give a Damn with a question mark. Uh -huh. And then we changed the name to What Matters. Like Interesting. Years ago. Was this on like Hulu at one point or something like that? Um, I feel I, like I've seen this movie. <laughs> yeah, there, there is another one oh, is that okay. was done in South America right after we did ours. Three other guys. Okay. Did, so did both one. of you guys it might did be, three. That's called Living on One, I think. So you might have seen that one. Whatever it was, it was a while ago. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the concept is so intriguing. What made you want to do that? What made you want to live on a dollar twenty-five a day? So I would say for Dan and I, um, he was an intern at the youth group that I went to all through high school. And so our senior year, we started learning about major injustices in the world. Uh, and we watched, you know, a documentary about child soldiers in northern Uganda. And we, you it's know, invisible children, yeah, invisible yeah. children. We went to this big old conference called Urbana that was in St. Louis. And the whole theme was human trafficking, sexual exploitation. And I was in the process of actually reading cover to cover through scripture because I was having a conversation with a, a buddy of mine that was a different faith and challenged me and asked me tons of questions on why I believed what I claimed to believe. And I didn't have great answers for him. So I was, you know, studying this book that I'd grown up saying was the words of God, you know. And so uh, just in the process of reading cover to cover through the Bible, I saw God's heart for the oppressed and the marginalized, the exploited, and him calling those who believe in him to do things like speak up on behalf of and, and defend and protect and rescue and maintain the rights of you know, those who can't speak for themselves. And so as we kind of started learning about these major injustices, we just thought, okay, why, why does a fifth of the world, 1.4 billion people live in extreme poverty? You know, how has the world gotten to where it is and what's being done to try to eradicate extreme poverty? What out there can an average person be a part of to see an end to you know, extreme Right, poverty. so that's a good, that's a nice answer. But <laughs> here's the deal. I know lots of people who get exposed to things their senior year of mm. high school and they get really riled up about it and they're angry about it, but that's mm. it. Yeah. But you did something about it. You made a documentary, you started this, this, uh, this building in um, Malawi. Mm. So what is it, what, what is it that's, because I'm kind of the same way. I, I started something, like I actually had to do something about it. So what, what is it? What's, what's, what's the secret sauce? Yeah, I would say my freshman year in college, I was studying nursing and I had taken a spiritual gifts test. It showed mercy as my you know, number one gift. And then I read the five love languages. It showed physical touch as my number one you know, way that I express and, and receive love. And so I thought, okay, nursing makes sense. You know, if I could be in a hospital helping people who are sick get better. Uh, but just in the course of, you know, going to school for that first year, I just was kind of thinking, I don't think this is for me. And then I got this opportunity to be a part of this documentary where we traveled all over the world. And I saw extreme poverty face to face. And I was also, again, like I said, reading through the Bible, I got to the New Testament where Jesus is just pretty much explaining, this is what those who follow me, those who believe in me, they'll do all these radical things, you know? And I thought... I, out of these 14, 15, you know, just sell everything and abandon your families and hate your lives and like, you know, just daily take up your cross and follow I me. I was like, I don't think I've ever done a single one of these <laughs> yeah. radical things that he, he just says, uh -huh. you know, people who follow me, they'll do these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was like, man. So honestly, I kind of got into... Well, let me, ask, say, let me okay. ask you something. So you, you're reading these things and you're saying, this, my life doesn't look like this. Right. Were you also kind of wondering... You know, the people around me, maybe their lives don't look like this either. Like, was, were any of those thoughts going in your head, like, honestly? I got a chance to go to Kenya in 2007, and I came home, and for a good year and a half to two years, I, I just wrestled with a lot of bitterness in my heart, and especially yeah. toward the church. You know, growing up in the church, I just thought, man, if God's heart is really for the poor, and one of my favorite verses is Jer Jeremiah 22, 16, it just says, King Josiah defended those who are poor and needy, and is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord. You know, I'm just like, okay, the church is to show the world what it means to know him, we should be helping the poor and needy with our, you know, everyday, like our everyday energy, our talents, our gifts, you know, our funds, whatever it might be. The mm -hmm. sermons should reflect, you know, God's heart. Yeah. And so, so yeah, I definitely wrestled a lot with bitterness, judgmentalism, pointing my mm -hmm. finger at people. Then I kind of came to this, I don't know, I think the, the Lord just kind of showed me his heart where it was just like, Jesus, his invitations were, you know, just like very, you know, his language is very much inviting into a better way of living, you know, to give is better than, than to receive, you know. 
Um, and so I realized that, okay, if I'm pointing my finger at people and telling them what they should and shouldn't do, that's, they're, they're, not, they're not responding very well to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I can motivate people instead of by guilt. Uh, Jesus motivated people by joy. And so he, he kind of started to uproot some of that bitterness. And, yeah. Yeah, the reason I ask that is because I have, I, I went through the exact same thing. Mm. And I feel like I'm on the other side of it now. I also mm. have a lot, of, uh, a lot of the people who kind of follow what I'm doing. That's a, probably like the number one question I get asked is like, I'm, like now that I'm awakened to kind of the state of the world and other, or the, other parts of the world, um, I'm really angry that people don't know about it more, don't care <laughs> yeah. about it more. And, and, I, mm. and so my response to them is like, I totally sympathize. I've been there. Mm. You've been there. Right. But yeah, there is, I mean, there's more effective ways to approach these situations. And um, also like a better example, like I think Jesus has a, a way better example uh, with like, yeah, he didn't, he didn't go around telling people like how much they, you know, how much you guys stink. It was, yeah. it was more like, it was like leading by example, showing his love, showing his joy. Yeah. It, you're right. Okay, so let's get back to your story. You landed in Malawi. How did that happen? Like you, you did the documentary, let's move on to Malawi. Totally. How's that, how's that come about? Yeah, it was primarily in 2009. Uh, my church actually did a three-week series on fasting. And just, you know, two of my friends came up to me at the end of this first week and said, we want to try to fast for 21 days. And I'm 21 years old at the time. I'm not really sure what I'm going to do with my life. I'm like, yeah, maybe a fast could help shine some you know, light on what God has created me for, what the purpose that he has in mind for my life is. And so entered into this 21-day fast. The documentary, you know, goes into mm -hmm. that story the first 10 minutes kind of tells this background, yeah. you know, more in detail. But yeah, just, you know, entered into this fast, didn't eat 24 hours a day for three weeks. Yeah. You know, straight. Just, just water and... We did juice and tea. Okay, I yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then the last night of this fast, I felt like the Lord was kind of leading me to stay up all night in the basement with Him. Really? Just spend time in prayer. If it was the last night of the fast <laughs> for me, I'd be like, I'm just going to go to sleep <laughs> yeah. right now <laughs> yeah. so I can wake up and eat. Totally. But, That's exactly what I So you had this, this opposite, like you just yeah. can, you can, you're too restless. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. I was reading through the book of Luke and chapter five talked about how Jesus would often go to lonely places and pray. Chapter six said the night before he chose his 12 disciples, he stayed up the whole night in prayer and so I felt like the Holy Spirit was kind of like David do you really want to do the easiest possible thing at the end of this time you've committed to me you know I wanted to go to bed at nine o'clock so I can get up at four in the morning yeah. and start eating and he's like what if instead you just did the total opposite so I was like mm -hmm. eh, all right <laughs> good guy so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who, yeah who are you gonna argue with yeah I was kind of just thinking man Jesus could whisper one thing in a moment that could change the whole rest of my life you know yeah. I could try to I could try to have my heart be broken by injustices. I could be moved, you know, in my in intellect by statistics, but those things aren't sustainable. I'm gonna wake up a month later, those statistics are gonna fade, those emotions are gonna fade. The only true sustainable, motivating, you know, like source, most powerful, you know, motivating, sustainable source, I believe is the voice of God. And he can sustain us when things get difficult. He can uphold us and say, this is what I've created you for. You know, this is my Holy Spirit will come alive in you to make it through and you'll depend on me more and more. And so, yeah, I was just like, I just want to hear you. You know, John 10 says like we're sheep and God is our shepherd and we recognize his voice and we can be led by that. So mm -hmm. it's like, just tell me what it is that you've created me for. So you created a space to listen to mm. the voice of God and totally. did you hear it? Yeah. So he answered in a unique way that later I found out was um, kind of the theme of that first documentary, these two questions, what breaks your heart and what makes you come alive? And so he, you know, just helped, helped me realize that he created me to help see an end to sexual exploitation. That's something that breaks my heart. That's something primarily, you know, first that breaks his heart and he's shared his nature, his character with me uh, so that my heart reflects his. And so it's like, man, this is an injustice that breaks, you know, mm -hmm. your heart, it breaks my heart. We can do something about this. And then he also shared with me something that he's created my heart to come alive into, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, to be excited about. And so, yeah, I, mean, I would just, you know, invite anyone to ask that, like, okay, what is it that when I think about it, I just think that shouldn't exist in the world. Something needs to be done about that. Yeah. You know, and then also, what is it that I fill my free time with? What do I mm -hmm. love doing? What, you know, time just flies by, gets yeah. me out of bed in the morning. And I just believe that we've, we've all been created to be able to do something that we love while mm -hmm. seeing an injustice be eradicated. I want to touch on something before we move on. The idea that you're coming, that you're bringing up is very important. The idea of like having this purpose, this like mm -hmm. meaning you wake up and you're like so, like I, I'm the same way. I wake up every day and I'm so pumped to work on donor C mm. and to work on alleviating extreme poverty. I love it. I just, I love working. On, it's, it's so meaningful to me. Mm. I have a lot of friends who they just work a normal office job mm. and you know, a normal office job. And so, but what, what do you think about that? Like, can they have an equal amount of meaning in their lives or are they somehow living 
less meaningful lives because they're not doing something so overt. I think it's one of those things where, yeah, I mean, no matter what, no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, we can always ask the Lord, Jesus, show me what it is that you're doing. He's moving everywhere in the world. He's moving inside of us. He's speaking all the time, just so much of the time. I think the majority of the time we miss what it is that he's doing. So we can't be a part of what he's doing because we, we don't stop to just see or ask him to show us what is it you're doing? How can I be a part of this? And I, yeah, obviously if he's moving everywhere in the world, he can move in your workplaces, in your cubicle, you know, you can mm -hmm. roll over to the guy right next to you and just like, man, you know, I just wanted to encourage you, you know, so I definitely think that you can live on purpose, you know, on mission, wherever you are in the world. But I think we can't limit it just to my workplace, my job is my, my mission. I think that mm -hmm. God has so much more for us and we can't restrict mm -hmm. him just to that. You know, sure, we can take a short term missions trip. We can quit our jobs and become a missionary or we can just, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, just see something local in our communities like, man, that, you know, the, the effects of depression or you know, divorce on, on that person is like really breaking my heart. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, look around at the injustices, even in your own context and see, yeah. well, how can I do something that I love to help this injustice be eradicated? Yeah. So what I'm hearing is that it's possible to do meaningful work wherever you are. And, but also like if you're working a normal nine to five job, then you can do meaningful it, that can be a meaningful experience, but also whatever you do outside of work can be all very meaningful as well. Absolutely. And it's, it doesn't stop at the end of the workday. So you get over to Malawi and um, let's skip ahead to the moment that you decided to take this big leap, which was to build this center, which was a huge deal. So how, how did you decide to do that? Yeah, so my father and my pastor, we just started doing research. This country, Malawi, you know, after this, this initial night of doing the fast in 2009, the Lord just showing me, I've created you to mentor men, disciple men, help see an end to sexual exploitation on the demand side of things, you know, and then also work toward helping girls, you know, vocational training um, and um, trauma counseling type of thing. So it's just like, what does that look like? How could a young guy play a role in this? And so I actually entered into probably a year and a half or, two, you know, two years of just kind of sitting back. I was still in college. I was mm -hmm. finishing out a missions degree, you know, at mm. St. Louis uh, Christian College. And uh, so I was just, I, I had this time to just kind of incubate. You know? It was like a year and a half. Yeah, okay. it was a year and a half um, before I went to Malawi for the first time. And then another six months before it kind of evolved into an mm -hmm. organization. How important was that time? Because I know oh, a lot of people yeah. who, they get this idea, mm -hmm. they go, they, they're fresh, mm -hmm. landed in a brand new totally. country, they don't know the language, they don't know the culture, but mm -hmm. they want to do something. Absolutely. They want to hit the ground running. Yeah. How important was that year and a half, that, and then plus the six months? How yeah. important were those two years? Yeah, I would say if we do just kind of hit the ground running, a lot of times we're just doing it in our own strength. We're doing it based on those emotions. We're doing it based on intellect. And if you want to make it, you know, any kind of change in the world for the better, mm -hmm. you're going to just face tons of challenges and tons of difficulties. It's going to be, you know, like the Bible just promises, you know, John 16, Jesus says, if you're in this world, you're going to face tons of suffering, tons of trials. Mm -hmm. First Timothy talks about if you want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you're going to face trials of many kinds. And so uh, if we do just do things, try to do things in our own strength and just rush into something mm -hmm. based on our intellect, based on our emotions, I just believe we'll, it won't be sustainable. Yeah. Uh, we'll just get And that's out. what ends up happening yeah, ultimately. We'll awesome. Whenever I see someone hit the ground running. Yeah. They're gone in three months, right. or a month. But when we wait on that leading from the Lord and just say, okay, I'm not going to do this without you. I want you to mm -hmm. do this. That, that time of waiting, I think, it does a lot. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that it, it, it did for me was just help to lower my ego, help to lower you know, what I, how amazing I think I uh -huh. am. Yeah. And just like, okay, I, I can't do this without the Lord. You know? okay. So it brings in some humility in that time of waiting. And I loved how Paul, you know, after getting knocked off his horse, waited about three years you mm -hmm. know, before he kind of jumped into ministry. So we see that in, mm -hmm. in biblical that's a, context. Yeah, that's, well. a, that's a good precedent. Yeah. All right, so, so two years go by and then initiation. What's the... What's the instigating event? Yeah, so all of a sudden Malawi, you know, c comes up in my life by the fourth, like, random occurrence of this country uh, that I'd never heard of before. I think maybe this isn't a coincidence. <laughs> you know, the Lord might be calling me here. We just jumped on Google, found six mm -hmm. different organizations that are doing something with child abuse or gender-based violence, sent out emails. We only hear back from one person in the whole country of Malawi. Uh, she's our only connection, this woman who started the Malawi Human Rights Resource Center, Emma Kalia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we hear back from her. She said, yeah, I'd love to meet you. <laughs> my dad, my pastor and I, we fly halfway around the world with one connection in the whole country <laughs> yeah. of Malawi. And just said, we believe the Lord has called us to build some kind of safe home, start there and move into somehow seeing an end to sexual exploitation. Is that something that's needed in this country? Can you point us in the right direction? That's where it might best be located. Mm -hmm. And her jaw drops open. She says, for the last 14 years of my life, I've been trying to do everything I can to open a home exactly like like that. There's nothing like it in the whole country of Malawi and I'll do whatever I can mm -hmm. to help you. 
I love it. All right, so let me ask you this. So this organization, they find out that you're interested in building a center to help people who have been sexually exploited. Mm. How much did they believe that you were serious about that and that you would actually follow through on that? I think she was pretty skeptical. When uh -huh. I showed up, I actually had, in 2011, when I got there, I had dreadlocks that were oh, past yeah. my shoulders. <laughs> okay, so you were... <laughs> Cool. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, were, you were getting into the culture. That's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah so in Malawi, maybe we'll superimpose a picture. So <laughs> yeah, maybe. yeah. If you have dreadlocks in Malawi, you're just assumed to be a drug dealer for most uh -huh. of the time. Okay. So, yeah. So yeah, they're like, okay, you know, mm -hmm. he seems young, mm -hmm. but yeah, they're just kind of open. You know, well, let's see if this turns into anything. Might Even, as well. Yeah. yeah. Actually, when I met the senior chief of the community, I, I actually cut my dreads off. It okay. was hard, yeah, but yeah. I, I started to realize, okay, culturally, these uh -huh. aren't seen the same way as they are in America. You know, <laughs> yeah. here we're kind of seen as like hip and activisty. Yeah, you know, and I was like, well, <laughs> yeah. that's that's the opposite. Uh -huh. You know, there. And so yeah, I cut them off. Had a buzzed head. I met the senior chief. Met a bunch of people in the community that were leaders and. Um, and yeah, they ended up actually in 2011 in the summer, I went back for three months, just developed a lot of relationships. They ended up gifting about nine football fields worth of land totally mm -hmm. for free uh, to the organization of yeah. Women of Saints. Three minutes outside of the one community that has the highest ratings of gender-based violence mm -hmm. in the whole country of Malawi because, you know, Emma kind of pointed us in that direction. And how, like, so you got nine football fields worth of land. How important was that? Mm -hmm. Like, wh why was that an important part of this story? I would say it was important because it's so vital for local, you know, people in the community to see this, to say, this is a value, you know, this is something that we want in our community. We see value in this and we're not just coming in as Americans, kicking down the doors, it's like, do this and change this and we're going to buy this and like <laughs> fix your problems, yeah. you know, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> but just, you know, being able to realize, hey, Malawians probably know, you know, the problems that they face better than someone coming from halfway around the world and they probably know solutions to those and we can just empower and come alongside of them, mm -hmm. you know, and so for them to be able to say, yes, we really want this in our community, we see value and we're, we're willing to actually sacrifice ourselves for we're not just sitting here and give us everything, you know, solve our problems for us. But they're saying, hey, we'll help you and we'll come alongside of you and, mm -hmm. and invest in this and sacrifice for this too. Was, okay. Yeah, it was really important. So they're invested, mm. but you still, I mean, you have land. You have nine football fields worth of land, but there's no building and right. the buildings aren't cheap. So yeah. what do you do? Yeah, so then went back to the U.S. You know, that's when we kind of had our first fundraising dinner banquet. And that's when it took... And I would say it took another two to three years of just kind of yeah. fundraising, kind of stirring up this momentum where it's like, wow, this is actually, you know, going to happen possibly. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> thing. Like, this is becoming a reality. Um, there's definitely a shift that takes place, you know, mm -hmm. in our hearts and minds where we just are idealistic and just are running at something, just mm -hmm. hoping that it works out. And all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, this, <laughs> this might actually yeah. work. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that shift started taking place. I would say that first banquet in November of 2011, we had about 160 people come. We raised okay. 20 and $28,000 in yeah, one night. Yeah, that one night, okay. Yeah, gotcha. and so that's when, you know, we just started sharing the story of, man, we met this woman, we met the senior chief, he says mm -hmm. this is a huge need. And then people started seeing this vision and saying, I wanna be a part of helping to make this a reality. Now, you, I know that you're comfortable talking about this because it's brought up in the documentary, but um, mm -hmm. one of the things that was happening around the same time is that you were realizing that there's this personal struggle going mm -hmm. on inside of you. Mm -hmm. And it was, almost at odds with what you were trying to accomplish. Right. Would you mind yeah, sharing about that? Absolutely. Uh, definitely, you know, for years, probably since I was 11 years old, I think I first saw, you know, a pornographic image. That was a struggle inside of my heart and addiction. I had actually worked in this youth group through high school. You know, I had joined these accountability groups to try to get freedom from those things. No matter what I tried, nothing seemed to work. I kept falling back into this addiction. Um, you know, it seemed like the further I went, the further like two, three months of not doing that, it would just come back, you know, with more vengeance type of thing. It's just like, I kind of got to the point where I accepted defeat and just said, okay, this seems like this is going to be a part of my life for the, forever. Uh, and now God, you seem to be calling me into something that is supposed to end sexual exploitation. Well, I'm part of the problem. I'm objectifying women and exploiting them, uh, to just to benefit myself. And so it's just beautiful that, um, the Lord. You know, if we look at Israel in the Old Testament, like he didn't come to them and just be like, here's my 10 commandments, you know, let's see how well you, mm -hmm. uh, you yeah, perform. Good luck, guys. Yeah. <laughs> and then depending on if you do a good job, I'll set you free. You know, it just said he heard the cries of his people. 
in enslavement and then he's liberated them supernaturally and then they were like we want to worship this god that set us free and so then he's like okay here's the ten commandments mm -hmm. so i just believe he spoke identity he spoke purpose over me and said this is what i've created you for i know if to you it doesn't make sense right now you know but <laughs> like as i call you into this purpose then i'll bring freedom to you you know and i'll show you how you can worship me and so i just found myself in that enslavement crying out and saying I don't know, I can't fix myself, I can't change myself. And he's like, yeah, I was waiting for you to realize <laughs> that it's not up to you, it's not how hard you try. And yeah. then just supernaturally, instantaneously, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I believe that he, he just, I felt something break away from my heart mm -hmm. and float away. It was actually about five days after the fast, February 5th. Okay, so the, the thing that had to happen there was for a long time, you were trying to fix it, saying like, this mm -hmm. is, it's gotta be me that fixes mm -hmm. it. And um, then the realization you had to come to was you can't, mm -hmm. but there is the possibility for it to be fixed from an external source. Yeah, I don't even know how I you know, necessarily just came to that conclusion. I just remember sitting at my kitchen table just mm -hmm. thinking, I literally had just said this is going to be something I, yeah. I deal with and I hope no one finds out 20 years from now. It's like, oh, yeah. the guy who starts organization, I was, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. be on his computer, you know, it becomes uh -huh. a scandal. And that's when, yeah, I was just praying and just asking for humility, asking for God to change my heart and mm -hmm. just supernaturally, just, you know, instantaneously got mm -hmm. liberated from. So we'll, we'll get into when, when this hangs in just a moment, but what would you say to someone right now who's watching this? And I know there are people who are watching it who are in the place where you were before you had that, before you had that cutoff moment. Mm. What would you say to them? I would just say, cry out to the Lord, ask him to change you, you know, and realize that sure, you know, Jesus demands a lot of people who follow him. He does. Um, but in some ways, I believe that he demands perfection of us so that as we try, we realize that we can't be perfect without him. And mm -hmm. so it opens up a place in our heart where we fail over and over and over miserably to realize like, Jesus, just please come and save me. I, I don't want to do this alone. Mm -hmm. I can't do this without you. You know, so yeah, I would just encourage you. Um, you know, God loves you like crazy. He's a father and he wants to see you free. You know, it's not mm -hmm. like he's just like waiting, upset, like, wow, yeah. when are you going to figure this out? Um, and so I think the first thing we can do, you know, is just come to him and just say, God, my heart isn't what, you know, I want it to be. It's not what I know you created it to be. There are things inside of me and there's lies that I'm believing that aren't supposed to be there. I need you to help me. I need you to liberate me, you know, please. And just, you know, he hears the cries of his people while they're enslaved and he can do supernatural things to change, mm -hmm. change our hearts. I know that this part of your story is also a very crucial part of the mission of One of the Saints. Mm. So how do, how do those two things tie together? Pretty much the Holy Spirit, I'll, I'll kind of skip ahead a, a, you know, a few years, just as we're bringing girls out of sexual exploitation, we started, the Holy Spirit really started to show us, if we only focus on trying to see an end you know, to these, these girls being brought out of exploitation, we're gonna create an empty position, a void, and the same number of men are going to be wanting to abuse the same number of girls. Mm -hmm. So indirectly through the effectiveness of our ministry, more girls who wouldn't have otherwise been trafficked and been abused are all of a sudden mm -hmm. filling those positions that we created. Mm -hmm. So now more girls are being abused that wouldn't have otherwise been abused if it wasn't for right. us. So that would be a, uh, a Band-Aid solution. Totally. Something that just goes on top, but there's an underlying issue totally. that is going to continue to provide momentum to this horrible uh, Yeah, I've situation. heard it referred to as like a compassion approach is kind of the bottom up. And it's mm -hmm. just like, let's feed people who are hungry, you know? Mm -hmm. And then it's like a top down, a justice approach is like, okay, why is there this drought happening year after year? If we provide, you know, a, a, a well or something that can give water to keep these crops, you know, alive, can that feed the people so that, yeah, it, we don't have to come back year after year to feed those who are starving, but they're sustainably you know, this, there's a solution that's found to this, you know, this starvation. Yeah. And so that's kind of what we saw is if we're just doing this compassion approach to help these girls out of injustice, the justice side of things with the men will still be there, mm -hmm. just perpetuating that. I mean, we're just cutting off the branches while the roots are thriving to regrow those branches. Like, yeah. like you said, that Band-Aid solution. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we just, man, the Lord started showing us that the only true sustainable solution and seeing an end to sexual abuse will be found in seeing the hearts of men be transformed, you know, what we believe only the gospel of Jesus can do mm -hmm. and give them a brand new heart. So this is something that you believe is not just, it's not just your organization is doing this thing. Mm -hmm. There are other people who can be a part of this mission and what would that look like for them? 
Yeah, again, like you're saying, you know, what does it look like for a guy sitting in front at a nine to five job mm-hmm. in a cubicle? Yeah. You know, it's like, is he just missing out on <laughs> like all well, of it? What's this? important is he's not missing out. <laughs> totally. Like, he's like, right. he's got a vital role to play, like yeah. vital. Yeah. yeah, totally. So what we've also just, you know, I believe the spirit has kind of helped us as an organization understand is that every single human being on the face of the planet has a vital role to play. And I believe it's with their everyday interactions, mm-hmm. you know, particularly with members of the opposite sex. I grew up all through middle school, all through high school just trying to find my identity and my sense of value and what specifically like the members of the opposite sex girls thought about me if I could get them to laugh at my jokes if I could get them to Mm -hmm. like me to pay attention to me then I you know thought that that would be a solution to you know eradicating loneliness or emptiness from my heart and I realized no matter how much you know attention I would get it would it would always just actually just leave me feeling more empty and more hungry uh, for that validation Mm -hmm. and so you know if we are trying to just take advantage of and exploit even on an emotional level. Jesus says what happens on a heart level is to him no different than what happens externally. By looking at someone as just someone, how can I take something from them to benefit myself? You know, that's the same as committing adultery, you know, committing this outward, very physical sin. Um, So again, you know, just realizing, okay, if I actually find my identity in Jesus, the only being in the universe that I can actually get identity validation, you know, from, then I won't be at this place where I'm having to promote this culture and the spirit of exploitation globally. I can actually do the opposite. I can speak life. I can validate other people, you know, mm. and speak, you know, that dignity and, and respect. And I can honor members of the opposite sex and promote a culture of freedom globally and change a culture in the world. And we can be a part of seeing an end to sexual exploitation, you know, I believe with our everyday interactions. Mm-hmm. I think that's where it has to start. Totally. It can't start with those people over there need to right. fix their problems. Absolutely. Um, that group has has something wrong with them. Mm-hmm. It's like, wait a second, like there's within this sphere, yeah. like right here, if I grew a circle around my feet, <laughs> right. if I fix that first, mm-hmm. then good things will come from that. Absolutely. And I to- I'm totally bought into that concept. So I, I thank you for When the Saints and, and what you're doing through them and the, the message that you're trying to get out there. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to tell our audience before we wrap up? Yeah, I mean, I guess you'll probably put like the win, the website, you know, mm-hmm. winthesaints.com. People check out the website. They'll yeah. be able to follow you on Donor C, which totally. is how we got connected in the <laughs> yeah. first place. Um, and that's a great way to see like visually what you're doing on the ground, Absolutely. which is super cool. Yeah. Um, and then also we'll put a, is the is there a link to the documentary? I have like the secret yeah. link. But yeah, I don't the know. link is um, there. It's on Amazon Prime. Okay, so if you're so an we'll Amazon Prime member, is it you can okay? Watch cool. It for free. Yeah, so or people can, can watch it on their big screen TVs totally. too. That's that's how they should watch it. Yeah, yeah. or you can go to the it's website. It's quite the experience. Like, yeah, as you saw with the trailer. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Just you know, right now in Malawi, we have the first and only safe home in the whole country with 22 girls. You know, between the ages of five and 15, two little babies mm-hmm. that have just undergone traumatic sexual experiences. And yeah, yeah. We're, we're, this year, my wife and I are moving to Malawi, you know, we're going to be spending the majority of probably 10 months a year in Malawi. Previously, I've only kind of traveled there twice a year for two, three, four months at a time. Mm -hmm. But we're kind of shifting that now as we're moving into sustainability, Mm -hmm. you know, and helping that nine nine football fields have a big old garden and an orchard and chickens and just generate income so that they're not dependent on funds coming from outside all the time and we're also moving more into that ongoing discipleship with men we've done kind of some outreaches to men and seen a great response but now we want to enter into that Mm -hmm. kind of long-term relationship development with men to help them walk in sexual integrity well i want people to understand i i spent three years living in malawi so i think the long way that's roughly where you're moving and it's not like it's easy to move from america to malawi it's like there are a lot of challenges associated with that and so i want I just want to emphasize and affirm that you are doing, you are walking the walk. You're, you're, you're definitely someone who's like uh, taking on personal sacrifice to see good happen in the world. And that's the only way it can happen. So David, thank you for, uh, for your time. Thank you for your work. And I hope people, I sincerely hope that people will continue to follow along with what you're doing, watch your movie and so forth. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me again, Greg. Absolutely.